Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here, even though admittedly it's a bittersweet pleasure because uh, we were expected to be all together physically in person in Venice. And I want to especially thank my colleague Anna Morbiato for um, you know, first introducing me to this event and uh, for being here with us. So um, I'm going to offer a few reflections on the role of the humanities at uh, a very special time, times of crisis, which I um, want to, uh, in a way, represent by way of a very unpleasant picture. Venice is the city of pleasure, Venice is the city of delight, but I've chosen a picture taken by a friend of mine that um, unwittingly picks on a very famous trope, the trope of Venice as a woman, Venice as a bride uh, married to the sea. And in this picture that was taken last November during the Aqua Alta um, that was a, a record-breaking uh, flooding, uh, shows uh, what seems to be a wedding dress abandoned by you know, someone who was probably looking forward to the best time of her life and found herself in the midst of a disaster. And, and so, uh, almost allegorically, this picture shows Venice as uh, overcome, overwhelmed by the flood and turned to refuse. Um, I hope that I can show a more hopeful picture at the, at the end of this talk. But for the time being, I have to uh, admit that um, if someone wanted to write an encyclopedia of disasters, they could have really chosen Venice uh, and, and be here for a few months because in the space of uh, a semester in academic terms, uh, we've really gone through uh, some major uh, catastrophic events. Chronologically, you know, in November 2019, uh, Venice suffered the worst flooding in half a century. Um, typically, you know, we are used in Venice to what we call aqua alta high water, which means that sometimes the streets are flooded and they get up to your knees. If uh, it's really bad, if they, the water rises up to your, um, sorry, ankles. Uh, if it's really bad, it comes to your knees. Uh, typically, a very high aqua alta reaches 140, 1 meter 40 um, on tidal level, on sea level, uh, so 4.5 uh, feet. Uh, and on that November 12, 2019, we were totally shocked and uh, we were hit by the worst flooding in half a century, second only to the infamous notorious flooding of 1966 that not only flooded all the streets, so most streets, but also, as you can see in the picture, also, you know, sent our water buses stranded on, on, the, on the streets, blocked the city for days and caused a lot of devastation. Uh, a month ago, a month ago, a blast hit a chemical plant near Marghera, the industrial part of the mainland, injuring workers and uh, threatening Venice with uh, toxic black clouds. So we were in lockdown and we were advised to close all our windows because uh, for uh, very uh, anxious hours, we didn't know whether that cloud could be really harmful for the people. And sure enough, the reason why we're not meeting in person now is that since uh, early March 2020, we have been one of the early, early uh, cities to enter uh, the condition of lockdown during the pandemic. I um, want to quote Amitav Ghosh, the Indian writer that is uh, one of the uh, most significant, perhaps if not the most significant presence is my talk, when in a lecture he gave in Venice before all this happened, says that La Serenissima, the most serene republic, uh, the um, renowned nickname given to the city, had become La Turbatissima, the most troubled republic. 
So the most serene republic had turned into the most serene republic. Now, if you look at this picture, yes, this is a real picture. This is a realistic picture showing uh, a city officer trying to uh, sanitize uh, San Mark Square, the, the most famous and iconic place in, in, the, in, the, in the city. Uh, but this is also uh, inevitably um, a representation that um, participates into a genre. Um, when you describe Venice, when you write about Venice, when you paint Venice, when you film Venice, and when you take pictures of Venice, no matter what, you in a way add to a palimpsest, a very rich palimpsest, uh, uh, an encyclopedia of representations that is uh, century old. And so the idea of the empty city, the idea of the city hit by a pandemic uh, goes back at least to the 19th century, since the end of the Republic, and found its peak probably in Thomas Mann's famous novel, Death of Venice. So the question is for me, as a Venetian, as an intellectual, um, what do we do with these disasters? How does the city react to these disasters? And can the humanities play a role in coping with these disasters? One easy way would be to say, well, the humanities art can, at the very least, um, play a role of consolation, can accompany us as we uh, slowly drift towards inevitable death. I was recently part of a very interesting panel with a physician that is uh, a specialist in palliative care. When you assist someone who is beyond any medical treatment and needs to be accompanied to her or his death. And so the question that he raised was, can we palliate a city? So are we in a moment where we should simply palliate a city, accept that death is really, and, and cancellation, annihilation is the only scenario. Uh, I think that is something that should be taken into account. Uh, this is something we should really look straight in the face, but I think there's also alternative scenario. And I want to quote uh, my colleague, Serenella Jovino, one of the most distinguished scholar in the environmental humanities, when she says, what do we see in Venice if we read it as a text? What is its material narrative? To say that Venice body is a text, to read it is not simply a metaphor. Our global ecological crisis confirm how deeply unstable and delicate is the equilibrium of natural, cultural substances and forces. As the perfect epitome of this fact, Venice represents the discordant harmony of elements upon which human civilization lies. Even more so, Venice challenges the very possibility of such a harmony. To create a city suspended on a lagoon is an exercise in hybridity, not only because it mixes water and land into a new elemental combination, but above all because it is an act of hubris, arrogance, a violation of ontological facts. Certainly, hubris may also have a creative function, and Venice stays as the luminous splendor of this assumption. So I want to really capitalize on this concept of reading Venice as a text and also of thinking of Venice as an exercise in hybridity that can help us uh, interpret the larger and uh, question of the environmental crisis. All the three disasters that I have started with, the flood, the explosion, and the pandemic are different types of disasters, but they all ultimately go back to our symptoms of and effects of the larger environmental crisis. So the simple uh, thesis is that Venice is the place where to think hard and close about the environmental crisis and to possibly find even some uh, solutions or you know, raise more questions about the environmental crisis. As Amitav Ghosh again says and points out, the environmental crisis, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. Now, during the lockdown, we were at home and uh, for better or for worse, we saw that the world was looking at us. The news were filled with reports from Venice. 
And some of those reports were uh, very um, uh, accurate uh, um, and, and reported what was really happening here. The city typically teeming with people now become a kind of ghost town. But what I'm really fascinated with is also that that uh, moment triggered some fantasies, some fake news. And perhaps the most interesting type of fake news was that because of the lack of traffic, because of the lack of pollution, the city had been turned into a kind of zoological Eden where all sorts of creatures were uh, now uh, coming back. Now, it would be funny to play with you and ask you uh, which of these pictures are actually real. There's actually one that is real, the other are all fake. But what is kind of revealing is that if you look at how these images went viral, even my favorite one, the one with the flamingos, was considered true by thousands of people on the social network. So I think there is still a big investment in Venice as a site of fantasy. People want to fantasize about Venice. The irony of it is that I badly wanted to use that image with the flamingos for something that I'm going to show you later. And I couldn't do it because the author of that image uh, was not found. And so uh, for you who plan on coming back here, I'm sure, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, you will not find any flamingos, you will not find any crocodiles, uh, you will find swans, and maybe just at the sea you will find some. Dolphins. How do you reimagine the city? Now, um, as some people are saying, you know, oh, the pandemic was horrible. Let's hope we can go back to normal as soon as possible. And my answer to that is emphatically, I hope not. Going back to normal would be another way of approaching death. Because the normal before the pandemic, the normal before the Aqua Alta was not a normal that would guarantee survival for much longer. The Venice population uh, has drastically dropped since, not only since the uh, 16th century when Venice was one of the most important metropolises in Europe, but you know, uh, even since the 1960s, where it was arguably an overpopulated city. But as you can see, if you compare the numbers, the drop has been uh, really uh, remarkable. And the reason is that off go the residents, in come the tourists. The tourists that come with the cruise ships, the towering cruise ships that have become the icon of what we have learned to call over tourism, the cruise ships that disgorge literally thousands of day trippers that make the same square that we saw empty in the previous picture, um, completely crowded with, with people. And the third image on this slide is one that to me represents the commodification, the Disneyfication of the uh, heritage, the cultural heritage of, of, of the city. This comes from a museum that um, is a kind of franchise that has, I think, a lot of exhibitions in many other parts of the world where uh, real corpses are on display. Uh, plastinated cadavers, uh, apparently coming from uh, Chinese morgues, that are put on display. And here there is the Venetian version where you can see the cliche of the gondoliers kissing romantically on the gondola, except that the gondoliers and the lovers are literally uh, sort of, you know, dead people walking, zombies. So we risk being turned into a city of zombies. What happens if Venice dies? If Venice dies, this is the uh, opinion of one of our most distinguished and internationally renowned cultural historian, Salvatore Settis. The problem is that if Venice dies, this will not only be a question or a problem for the city, if Venice dies, it won't be the only thing that dies. The very idea of the city as an open space where diversity and social life can unfold, the supreme creation of our civilization as a commitment to and promise to and promise of democracy will also die with it. In short, Setis argues that if you go around the world, all cities are becoming more and more like one another. The skylines are the same, the buildings are the same, modernity makes cities all anonymous and uh, replicas of each other. 
It calls it the monoculture of the dull global city. In contrast with that, Venice represents the historical city, which he calls with a very felicitous phrase and definition, a thinking machine, a machine that enables us to think about something other than ourselves and thus helps us to learn about ourselves in the process. So it's really sad that we cannot be together today in person to have that kind of exchange. And I hope that this will be possible before too long. So I've shown you, I've started with the picture of Venice as an, a kind of, you know, abandoned bride. And I also want to show other pictures of Venice represent as a woman. Um, a very famous one, perhaps one of the most famous one, is a painting uh, by um, Tiepolo, Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, Neptune offering to Venice the riches of the sea, 7045. And what is so interesting about this famous painting where you see Venice's lion as a very tame pet being patted by this majestic uh, queen is that it was done when Venice had long stopped being the queen of the sea. But at the same time, it was using art to project this image of power and prestige and wealth to the world. What are we doing now in the 21st century? How are we representing the plight of Venice, the predicament of Venice? After the flood, the world apparently came to our aid. They wanted to help. And uh, a very important magazine published a cover that uh, wanted to raise money for the city, protect Venice. Once again, Venice is gendered, is personified, is represented as a woman, except that is no longer the uh, proud queen that treats uh, the god of the sea, Neptune, in almost a very dismissive way and accept the money. This is a woman dressed in black, like a widow or a mourning person, uh, the, 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 when I first saw it, I thought it was like a reference to the Adams family uh, myth, a modern myth. The fact that she carries a slab of stone where she says, protect Venice. How do you protect Venice? Donate money. And I have a lot of problems with both of this, not only with the iconography. Of course, there is the gondola. She's sitting on a, she's standing on a gondola, the unmistakable gondola. But there are two things that are really troubling for me here. First of all, the idea of protect. Protecting Venice has become, in the words of my um, archaeologist colleague, Diego Calaon, a kind of ontology. To protect Venice, to save Venice, to use another famous definition, is to almost to fossilize it, to petrify it, to keep it, to preserve it as it is, as if it's a body not too different from the corpses that we saw rowing on the gondola that is unchanging. It's like trying to preserve a mummy, as it were. And how do you do it? By giving money. I should have erased the, the, the uh, bank data, but ignore them. The point is here that this is not a message that can really actually help Venice. This a message of Venice as a passive recipient, a victim in need of international, international. Let me show you instead a far less visible and prominent example, but this is a young artist called Leonardo Marenghi, who was in Venice until yesterday uh, for two weeks in a kind of instant project that organized by our university and our Center for the Humanity and Social Change, where we said, how do we respond to the pandemic? And we invited five artists. We invited five artists to be in residence in Venice under the guidance of a local artist, and we ask them, explore the city, leave the city, and then produce some art. And I could, of course, show you all the pictures, but to stay in line with the theme of Venice as a woman, I show you Leonardo found this very interesting um, um, representation of uh, the Virgin Mary that you can find in a lot of places in Venice where the Virgin Mary has literally an umbrella. And these iron umbrellas are there to protect the, the marble from the weather. And so it's a, a, a very uh, sort of uh, um, 
material sign of, uh, of uh, resistance to uh, climate change. Arguably, probably today, you, you need more protection from the heat than from, from, from the rain. And you see that this Virgin Mary has become uh, a very concerned woman. And you can also see that uh, at the bottom of this etching, the color is becoming darker because the sea is rising and the sea is threatening Venice. And so this is a woman who's telling us there is a problem. Sea level is rising when should, we should uh, think uh, about that. Venezia riparte, Venice starts again. Venice restarts, that was the, the name of the project. So this is a small project, but also a project that says, we don't need more tourists. We don't need to go back to where we were before. We need more arts. We need more humanities. We need more creative people who would come to work with the city and create with the city. At this point, I really want to reference two very important books that have to do with Venice. Uh, the Great Derangement is perhaps to me one of the most uh, important books uh, on the humanities uh, written in the last few years where this great Indian intellectual scholar and novelist um, both makes a plea for putting the uh, environmental crisis at the center of our imaginary and imagination and also admits or acknowledges the limits of the humanities and especially of literature, his own art, in dealing with that. And yet, um, after publishing The Great Arrangement in 2016, uh, Amitav Ghosh published a novel, uh, Gun Island, uh, partly set in Venice. And Ghosh is arguably in the very rich literary canon of Venice, the first to connect the forces of capitalism and imperialism to examine both the impact of sea level rise and mass migration on the city. And this is a very uh, fast paced novel. It's been criticized for being full of improbable events including events then actually happened. You know, the, there is a violent storm at some moment that hits Venice, and that was exactly the type of storm that provoked the uh, record-breaking Aqua Alta in November 2019. And in this novel, the male protagonist is an intellectual, is a rare book dealer from India who moved to the States and comes to Venice. But there are at least three women uh, who from different angles, from different age groups, from different uh, points of view are all militant and active um, members of these um, necessary fight against uh, climate change. Uh, a humanist, Chinta, a marine scientist and an activist who documents the migrants crisis and what really is the center of the novel is the fact that when Amitav Ghosh himself was like the artist I showed you before, a writer of residence in Venice, he noticed that some of the migrants who constitute a local uh, community were uh, coming from Bangladesh. So he, they spoke his same language. Uh, he is originally from Bengal, uh, but also had ran away, had escaped from a country that is massively threatened by uh, sea level rise. So he, in a way, has created a novel that hinges on this uh, dramatic irony that you escape from a land that is invaded by the sea and of all places you arrive to Venice, which is another place um, uh, threatened by, by the sea. I really recommend this because this is a novel that is also uh, wonderful to teach. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, we had to move oral teaching online. And I think it was very important for me and for our students to be able to be uh, connected through literature and through literature that was also talking about our present moment, our present a crisis and also the way in which we can respond to, to the crisis. And I want to conclude by juxtaposing two images. Um, the waters, the plagues, 
Venice in times of crisis. On the left, you can see a Baroque masterpiece, the Basilica de Santa Maria de la Salute, the Church of uh, the Virgin Mary of, of Health that was built and planned right after the catastrophic plague that hit Venice, one of the many catastrophic plagues that hit Venice, in this particular case in 1630. That uh, church was immediately commissioned in 1631, um, and it took almost 50 years to uh, complete it. Actually, it took more than 50 years to complete it. But what I like about this is that the first response, one of the first responses, of course, it was a religious response, it was a spiritual response, it was a psychological response, but after the plagues, Venice said, let's build new art, let's invest in art. We need something that we can look in admiration, and the iron of it is that some people at that time considered that this church was too experimental, too modern, uh, because of its style. And so, I think that if we look at the history of the plagues in Venice, uh, we should not only think of uh, some tantalizing elements like the fact that the words quarantine came from Venice, that some of the sanitary measures that we have been experiencing in recent times were first tested because of the plagues in, in Venice, but also that after the plague that decimated the population, Venice invested both in important people from elsewhere and in new art. Next to it, I want to um, bring to your attention uh, another church uh, that from the outside looks less majestic, but it's really big. And it's a church where, by the way, the remains of Marco Polo were uh, in the Middle Ages before they disappeared. The Church of San Lorenzo has housed for the last few years, one of the most exciting cultural initiatives, Ocean Space. Ocean Space is a museum. It's a space entirely devoted to the relationship between ocean and so sea level rise and art and action. It's a place where you see beautiful art, where you participate in exciting and thought provoking cultural programs. And as the caption says, a collaborative platform for ocean imagination and ocean action. So what do we do in times of crisis? In times of crisis, we can decide to simply seize the day, enjoy the beauty of the city, and try to almost deny the fact that there may be even greater challenges ahead of us if we don't do nothing to stop the um, conditions that are uh, provoking climate change. But there's also a place to be investing in, uh, let's say, the cultural and creative industry. And to me, if I should, uh, if I were to distill the message of my talk, I would say that this is really the time to turn Venice into an international laboratory to think about um, sea level rise, in the larger context of the environmental crisis from a multidisciplinary perspective, uh, bring it together as ocean space does, uh, the scientists um, and the artists, the scholars, the intellectuals, the students. So we don't need more tourists. We need more students. We need more scholars. One of the other ironies of this condition is that we are living in a time where smart working, for better or for worse, has become a global phenomenon. So, you know, there are so many empty houses now in Venice. So if some smart workers will be listening to this, they may say, why, why don't I move to Venice and we can help you like the Serenissima did in the 17th century. I can tell you that this is still a great place to be where your senses and your intellect is really uh, stimulated uh, every single day. And alongside ocean space, uh, if you allow me 
a little bit of, of uh, publicity, you know, our own university has decided to launch the first Italian two-year master's degree in environmental humanities. And as you can see, no crocodiles, no dolphins. We also have some whales. But this is a program where we have really brought together the chemists, the ecologists, uh, the philosophers, the historians. It's a program entirely taught in English. And we hope that students will come here and will become the problem solvers of, of, of today's and tomorrow's crisis. My last image brings us finally back to this trope of Venice as a woman. In these days, we're talking about a lot uh, monuments and statues. Monuments and statues have become the object and target of political debate, of uh, iconoclasm, of ideological and ideological battleground. And I want to uh, talk to you briefly about my favorite monument in Venice that unlike all the other monuments and most monuments, the most traditional monument doesn't uh, stand erect in the middle of a square. This is the monument called a Monument to the Dead Partisan Woman, celebrating the role that anti-fascist women played in World War II to liberate Venice from the occupation of the Nazi and of the fascists. And uniquely, this uh, monument uh, stands at the edge of the lagoon. And on that fateful November 12, 2019, uh, I saw a picture on the social media that bombarded us with images of the uh, flooding where she seems to have disappeared. We really thought, oh, she's been washed away. And it was a moment of panic because when you lose your symbols, you really feel you're losing something. And so some of us just felt instinctively that they had to go there. And when the waters receded, we found out that no, that partisan woman was still there. And since she is a symbol of resistance, I also want to offer her as a symbol of the very important uh, position that we need to, 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 to take. We need to take, to quote Donna Haraway, the accept the condition that they were living in troubled times. We're living in, in a time that is not safe, where climate change is real, when sea level rise is real, and that any day we can all be submerged. But we also live with this idea that art can give us new ideas, new inputs, and also inspire resistance to us. So I would say very practically that Venice is, um, surviving this crisis, but also offering itself as a place where people from all over the world should really come and bring their ideas to think together, elaborate together, and create together new artworks and new ideas uh, about the city vis-a-vis -vis the sea, the city with the sea. And that could really uh, hail a new era and even new hopes. Thank you very much.